From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director. And today we're going to be talking about Afghanistan. There's a lot to discuss, from the end of President Ashraf Ghani's term and the September elections, to the state of U.S. Taliban talks and the intra-Afghan dialogue. Thankfully, we've got three excellent guests on today's program to help us make sense of what's going on and where things might be headed. Shamila Chowdhury, Marvin Weinbaum, and Michael Kukulman. Shamila is a senior South Asia fellow at New America, a senior advisor to Dean Bali Nasser at Johns Hopkins SAIS, and a former director for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the National Security Council. Marvin is the head of MEI's Afghanistan and Pakistan program. Michael is the Deputy Director of the Asia Program and Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. Marvin, I'd like to start with you. May 22nd marked the official end of President Ghani's term, so it seems like a natural time to take stock and look back before we focus on what might be coming up next with the September elections and indeed beyond that. How would you briefly assess his time in office? Well, it's mixed, obviously. Uh, he has made some efforts here to deal with the serious problem of corruption. One can't say that there's a great deal to show for it, but certainly the effort has been there. He has brought a certain amount of rationalization to the governing process. But where he's fallen uh, short, certainly, has his ability to rally the particularly the political class here. Uh, so we've got much more divisive politics perhaps than we needed to have uh, because of his style, his including his own personal way of, of dealing with those he interacts with. Michael, presidential elections are scheduled to be held in September, but there's a dispute over who should be in charge from now until then. Some suggest a caretaker government. Uh, President Ghani seems to feel differently. How do you see this playing out, and what are the prospects for uh, for a unity government? Well, that's true. You could understand why President Ghani wouldn't want an interim government. It would dilute his power. It would mean that his rivals, and there are many of them, would be in a position to to have power for a brief period. I think it really depends on on the trajectory of the peace process, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, clearly, the uh, the main uh, priority of the U.S. at this point is to try to uh, focus as much as possible on getting some sort of deal with the Taliban, and I think the hope. The initially, the hope was to have something in place by September when you have an election. Uh, I imagine it's going to have to take longer than that. But I imagine that um, this is going to be another possible trigger for tensions between the U.S. government and the Afghan government, or at least Ghani, because you know Ghani says he wants elections. He wants to stay in power. Uh, whereas the, for the U.S. government, I think the focus is on the peace process because President Trump wants to get out. So there could be a potential collision course in play uh, down the road. Shamila, on the issue specifically of the caretaker government, I know um, Prime Minister Khan in Pakistan got in trouble for some of the comments that he made, suggesting that that might help facilitate the peace talks. Um, has that kind of dynamic resolved itself? And what does that tell us about um, kind of relations between Islamabad and Kabul? Well, I know a lot of observers were surprised by Imran Khan's comments about the need for an interim government in Afghanistan. And I, I think he said it because he's a little bit politically naive, and that's not something a seasoned politician would say, especially when there are very sensitive talks happening um, in which Pakistan plays a role. But he's not wrong in making the statement. The statement itself is intellectually sound. And, um, you know, Michael spoke of this, too. I mean, it, having an interim, interim government makes it hard for Ghani, but it would actually facilitate peace talks in a much more easier way for the United States because they're not dealing with a government that has expectations of future kind of power um, or, you know, like le legacies of their own. And that's that's why we're in this situation right now, because Ghani wants to consolidate his power more than he wants to actually promote peace. Marvin, on the talks themselves, uh, the U.S. and the Taliban talks, the two sides wrapped up the sixth round in Doha earlier in uh, in May, on May 9th, I believe. Reports suggest that Special Representative Salmai Khalilzad is fairly optimistic about the progress being made, but uh, others are less so. Where do things stand, and are the two sides closer to making a deal at this point? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a tall order to <laughs> respond to. It's impossible to know what might be going on off the record. But if we judge it just by what is happening in Doha in these discussions, one can't say there's been a great deal of progress. What there has been is movement in the right direction, 
But the really tough questions here, uh, they have not been able to resolve. And I think that as you size up here where we are at this point, I believe, particularly as it's felt in Afghanistan, that this is starting to be some questioning about whether the Taliban really are sincere, fully sincere, or are for their own political and military reasons, stringing this out. So I believe that unless there is something in the very foreseeable future, which leads to indications that the Taliban is prepared to really compromise on, on core issues, that one can't be very optimistic about where this is going. But nobody exactly wants to give up on it because we don't have another way forward. Michael, I wanted to ask you uh, about the recent announcement that the U.S. military has stopped tracking who controls territory in Afghanistan. What does that tell us about its strategy? And is that a sign that's kind of going all in on the talks? Or or what do, what's your kind of read on that? Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. I think a first reaction is this is this is not a good thing at all because uh, you know it's almost like you think that the military wants to essentially hide the fact that we're losing ground and you know it's a great measure of success how much territory the Afghan government controls versus how much the Taliban controls and we know that the you know, the amount of territory that the Taliban controls and contests has grown significantly over the last few years. But you could also look at it another way. You could look at it uh, from the lens of of a shifting U.S. strategy. I mean, we've heard. Uh, a number of uh, U.S. military officials suggest that counterinsurgency is no longer the main objective. It's no longer the main strategy uh, in Afghanistan. And, f- and in, on the contrary, it's more to try to weaken the Taliban, to try to put more pressure on it. Of course, we've heard this story before. Put more pressure on the Taliban to convince it to, to go to the peace table to talk. And that suggests that you know, the military would, would think that it's irrelevant to be measuring what con- how much control the Taliban has because you don't need metrics for counterinsurgency anymore. But for me, the big thing is as, as a taxpaying American citizen, I want to know exactly what's going on in this war that that's clearly is going downhill. And to not know, to not have any idea how much territory is actually controlled by the Taliban, how much is not, that's a pretty significant omission and a big loss. Absolutely. Shamila, uh, you kind of touched on this earlier, but the fact that um, President Ghani isn't part of the U.S. Taliban talks, um, and there's a real sense that Afghanistan's future, and indeed his own political future, is being kind of decided elsewhere by other people and he's not involved. How does that kind of, where does that leave him politically, and how relevant is he to politics right now? Well, I don't think Ghani is relevant at all to politics right now. And um, part of the reason he's initiated this Loya Jirga process and kind of outreach to Pakistan is because he's trying to strengthen himself politically in the wake of kind of elections coming up later this year. Um, I don't think it's going to work because every Afghan leader since the U.S. started the war in Afghanistan has been supported financially and diplomatically by the United States. They are an extension of the United States. And I I think what happens is once they enter that position of power, they become diluted by other kind of goals. Um, and so I think Ghani has been very unrealistic. And he's acting just like Karzai did when he was in power. Towards the end of his tenure, he became very frustrated and just felt like he himself was a puppet. So I think that what we should watch moving forward is how the Americans publicly message about Ghani, how they publicly message about intra-Afghan dialogue. I don't think that they're going to be look, you know, using the public space to say that they support one candidate or the other, but it will matter who the Americans kind of pick informally in in deciding Afghans' political future. Michael, on the point of the Loya Jirga that was held in late April, early May, um, what was your kind of read on the motivation for that and what ultimately came out of it? Yeah, well, clearly the idea was to uh, contribute to this idea of intra-Afghan dialogue by having large numbers of voices from across the board coming together to reach or start on the road to some sort of consensus about how to move forward on the peace process. It did not achieve that objective. It was not a very inclusive lawyer jargon in the sense that, as I understand it, President Ghani actually did not let a lot of, a number of his rivals participate in it. But I think just the fact that it happened, I mean, you could say, yes, I mean, warts and all, it's, it's still important that it happened because there needs to be something. Uh, there had been another effort to bring a large number of people to Doha to have some sort of intra-Afghan dialogue. That ended up being postponed. So the fact that you had the lawyer Jarga, I think, is an achievement in of itself. But you look at the at the messaging that came out of it. So there was some type of, of statement that came out. It was a like boilerplate language. There wasn't much there. But 
you have to have those conversations. You have to start somewhere. So, you know, it's either glass, glass half full or glass half empty. And I would choose to look at it glass half full because, you know, you need to make some progress, even if it's incremental, to get more people talking and, you know, discussing the future and how to get to peace and reconciliation. Marvin, on the, the broader point of the uh, intra-Afghan dialogue, where do you see things right now? And what are the kind of main Im- impediments uh, to moving forward? Well, the main impediment is the election. <laughs> I think that everybody is positioning themselves at this point in terms of what they think is best going to improve their ability to, uh, to do well in that election. And so what you have here is uh, individuals who, for example, at one time were v- working very closely with Ghani now have taken a position 180 degrees uh, in opposition to him. So everything has to be judged by this election. Elections are destabilizing uh, under the best of conditions. They, uh, and especially in a weak state like, like Pakistan, a weak democratic uh, state. Uh, so we're going to have to live with that. But uh, as I have uh, said elsewhere, uh, I think that as if you have to choose between having the election with its disruptive elements here, where you pit parts of the political class against others, uh, and not having it, the legitimacy of the entire political system is at stake here if you don't have it. Now, let me just say that the country has, a, has had a, uh, a record here of delaying its elections. And so that in itself, even though it's extra constitutional to do this, that itself isn't a threat. But if you do it indefinitely, it's another matter. Absolutely. Shamarlo, at this point, are we any closer to a consensus among Afghans about what the terms of reconciliation with the Taliban would, would be like? No. In fact, I think what um, kind of the lawyer Jirga and just political elite kind of dynamics in Kabul have shown us that there is a huge divide between um, local concerns and those in Kabul, not just on political stability, but how the Taliban re-entering political um, society will change their lives. And so if you're not Pashtun in Afghanistan, you're really worried about Taliban reconciliation because you're thinking that you're uh, you know, women will be treated poorly, um, that the constitution will change to your to your disadvantage because you are a minority and the Taliban don't good, have a good track record of dealing with that. So there's there's a huge disconnect between the center and the periphery. And it's something that's historically, you know, uh, the case in Afghanistan. So I don't think it's anything new. But what's missing this time around is that the intra-Afghan dialogue isn't facilitating those concerns between, say, the Taliban and the local concerns and with Kabul. Like that is non-existent right now. And I think also the U.S. role isn't to facilitate that either. The Obama administration had that as one of its goals, but it, it stalled talks. Right now, to be clear, the U.S. goal is to facilitate its departure from Afghanistan. So it's really just focused on security. And while the U- United States might be concerned about the concerns of other Afghans about Taliban rec- reconciliation, they don't see it as its mandate. Marvin, both the inter-Afghan dialogue and the U.S.-Taliban talk seem predicated on the idea that we're somehow dealing with uh, a new and different Taliban, uh, to some extent at at least. But is that really a reasonable and realistic assumption to make? Well, we can say that the Taliban has changed. It does take into account uh, what happened in the 1990s. Uh, It realizes that the Afghan people have changed over time. At least it's beginning to realize that. Uh, it's It's changed in terms of its leadership and its organization and its messaging. I think that that's particularly a way in which they've become much more sophisticated. They think much more strategically, and they uh, now see the possibility here of political success as well as military success. So they have changed. What is yet to be seen here is whether they're ready to compromise on their core principles. And that brings up the question about to what extent do they really want to restore an Islamic emirate uh, or not? And that we don't have the answer to. Michael, the other factor that um, we haven't touched on yet is the issue of uh, Islamic State ISIS in in Afghanistan. To what extent does that complicate the equation? Uh, There have been reports recently that they've been kind of gaining ground against both the, the government and the Taliban. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting story because you're right. I mean, the messaging from uh, U.S. Uh, officials uh, is, is very interesting. It's sort of fluctuated between seemingly overplaying versus underplaying the threat. And now all of a sudden we're hearing that the numbers, the number of ISIS fighters in Afghanistan has shot up to several thousand, which to me seems a bit hard to believe, but one never knows. No, it's, a, it's a complicated state of affairs. On one level, uh, Islamic State and the Taliban are, are, are rivals. Uh, and the Taliban has actually been fighting Islamic State on the battlefield for several years. And has been actually making some progress. But now we're hearing messaging from the U.S. government now that the Islamic State's been able to hold its own. It's even been able to uh, take and, and hold some territory. I think the big issue when you look at peace and reconciliation, you know, Islamic State is not interested in participating in peace and reconciliation talks in Afghanistan. So that raises the question, if the very, very best, best case scenario occurs, there is a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban uh, on a troop withdrawal plan, and then the Taliban is willing to talk to the Afghans about some type of political settlement. These are all huge ifs. If the Taliban stops fighting, you still have Islamic State out there. And if it has gained the ground that we're hearing it has, that raises a question of what happens next. You know, is, is, and I think that would certainly have implications for, possible, for future U.S. policy, um, which to this point remains, I think, focused on counterterrorism related lenses. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, I would just add to that, that if, you know, if I were in the U.S. government right now and I had to game this out, what I would be thinking about is, Okay, um, an American priority is to facilitate peace talks with the Taliban so they have some kind of future political role. But we are not sure yet if the Taliban can bring everybody along. It's leadership, it's foot soldiers, it's ground commanders. What if it can't? And then what if these disgruntled Taliban want to go somewhere else and kind of fight against the new system that emerges from whatever that reconciliation is, they have another outlet to do that. They have the Islamic State. And that's sort of, you know, that sort of speaks to what Marvin was saying about weak state political, you know, weak political environments that you know, there are all these other um, avenues that um, terrorists or militants can pursue in South Asia to exercise their discontent. Now, we shouldn't be extremist in our thinking about that, that this can be, you know, this can take over and then the Taliban will end up fighting the Islamic State and we have to worry about that. But I just think that, um, you know, if the U.S. is going to pursue a strategy, what happens the day after has to be part of it. And they have to take into consideration these other groups that that do threaten their long term interests. As well as the question of ultimately what to do with fighters when the fighting stops. How do you reintegrate socially, economically uh, these people, the ones that aren't going to go off and join another group? We've got a precedent here, uh, a negative precedent. We thought we had a deal with uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar and his forces, uh, and uh, it turned out to be uh, one which was really one-sided. It's hard to see what the government has gotten out of it, but uh, he's returned now to Afghan politics, and the fighters that he brought with him, which were really not a danger so much on the outside, uh, have not disarmed as they were supposed to and could be a danger from the inside. We're running short on time here, but I definitely wanted to touch on the elections in September in a bit more detail before we conclude. Michael, at this point, under the current circumstances, is it even possible to hold kind of free and fair elections in Afghanistan? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's the big thing. There's certainly no guarantee these elections are going to happen. I think we mentioned they've already been delayed. As I understand it, there's still been delays in getting the results, some of the results from the, the parliamentary elections uh, s some time ago finalized. And, uh, you know, you don't what, you don't know what could happen beforehand. Um, does the security situation allow for them to take place? Because clearly presidential elections are of much greater scale than the, the ones that were that, that occurred uh, earlier. So I don't know. I mean, I don't even feel comfortable getting to conversations about, you know, who are going to be the candidates, who's going to win, because the, the, the real looming question is if they're going to take place. And of course, this is tied to the uh, to the to the peace process as well. Shamila, past elections in Afghanistan have proven, as, as Marvin referred to earlier, quite divisive and disruptive in general. Uh, the, the results for the parliamentary ones have only just come out, I think, this month. And is there anything that can be done to kind of reduce the scale and scope of that uh, divisiveness when it comes to these elections? Between now and late September when the elections happen, there's a lot of work to be done on the election commission itself to kind of calm the concerns of the political opposition. Um, Ghani has kind of 
replaced a lot of the commissioners in the election commission with his own loyalists. And there's discontent about that. There's concerns about vote rigging and the process itself and security. Um, so, but these are not new issues. These aren't, this isn't anything that didn't exist in previous elections. So I'm not optimistic that um, an election will happen in late September because there's also in parallel these talks with the Taliban that th they actually, both of these things, the elections and the talks destabilize each other. And it makes it very hard, I think, to move forward because everyone is stuck in a kind of a form of a political gridlock. Now, if the elections do happen, let's say they do happen, um, the result will be contested no matter what, I think. And we will be back to this previous scenario in which the Afghans disputed the result and the U.S. had to go in and broker some kind of deal. And that's how we got to where we are today with Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah in this strange kind of power sharing agreement, which really hasn't worked. And so it creates a lot more bureaucratic, diplomatic work behind the scenes for the United States, both in the lead up and then in the aftermath. And we just, you know, the United States doesn't have the political will to do that, even if it might have the bureaucratic muscle to do it at the State Department. It at the political level with the Trump administration's attention elsewhere, that's just not going to happen. So we're really in for a lot of political instability. I, I hate that I'm not more optimistic, but it's just going to be back to the future. Michael, we should wrap things up, but where do you see things going from, from here? What's your read? I, mean, I think the big issue here is that the clock is ticking, right? The domestic political uh, factors here in this country, in the U.S., suggest that, uh, you know, Trump, President Trump wants out. He was never comfortable being there. The U.S. embassy presence in Kabul is going to be drawn down significantly very soon. Uh, and we've got a presidential election coming up here uh, in, in, in just over a year. So I imagine the president would love to have an opportunity, say, at the Republican National Convention next year to say, well, we're pulling troops. And that could happen regardless of what's happening with peace talks. So it's all very troubling. Let, let me add one thing, and that is while all this is going on, this kind of political infighting, and we may see a real challenge even before the election uh, by the opposition here, they may go to the streets. My point is that all of this helps the Taliban. Uh, that's the bottom line here. They can just sit back and watch this happen and watch, in a way, an implosion here of the political system, which furthers, obviously, their ends and has a great impact on whether they're prepared to compromise. Unfortunately, we'll have to wrap things up on that uh, pessimistic note, but um, we'll certainly be keeping a close eye on the situation going forward. Shamila, Michael, Marvin, thank you all for joining the program today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.